but Entrepreneurial Appetite is a series of events dedicated to building community, promoting intellectualism and supporting black businesses. And when we talk about black businesses, we define that broadly. So uh, when we were meeting in person before COVID, we would meet at black owned restaurants here in San Antonio where I live and uh, discuss a book or a topic, but COVID happened and we had to make some shifts. And so since then we've been able to feature some authors and some other guest speakers who represent black businesses or black organizations. And so uh, today, uh, we have a very special treat for you. We have the president of Houston Tillerson University in Austin, Texas, Dr. Colette, Colette Pierce Burnett. And then we have the author of the Campus Color Line, Dr. Eddie Cole, who's an associate professor in the Graduate School of Education at UCLA. And so we're gonna begin the conversation by having um, Dr. Pierce Burnett just introduce herself, uh, introduce Houston Tillerson University and because we want to support black organizations, black businesses, and black colleges. Um, she'll give us some insights into how we can support HT, uh, particularly given the time with COVID and things like that. So, uh, Dr. Pierce Burnett. Good evening. First of all, I'm going to follow your lead and hold up my book and say um, how excited I am to be on this panel with two young brothers, um, Dr. Clark and Dr. Cole. Like for me, as a um, president, HBCU president, this does my heart well. It just puts an exclamation point on my work. So I really want to take a moment to honor that and to amplify that. It's very important. Um, so education is a great equalizer. Uh, as a first generation student myself, first in my family to go to college, I recognize that education just gives us opportunities. So Dr. Cole, for you to write this book and to give a lens into the struggle through that I, a lens that I had not looked through, um, even as a college president when it comes to history. And I, you know, I'm, I pride myself on, I love to read. So every opportunity I get to read some history and to see a different lens into it, I learn more and more and more. And, you know, I know a lot about historically black colleges, the history of my own institution, just to see it in, in a different aspect. Just thank you for putting words to it in a scholarly way. And that research I know was intense. And I really appreciated the part about the 50 year window to go back and find out the real story where you have to wait till that 50th year passes so that the, the, the data, the information is open up to you. So that shows persistence in the project. So um, I am very humbled and blessed to serve as Houston Tillerson University's president. And I've been here five years and I truly love the institution. Um, we're in Austin, Texas, and we, I love saying this, we are the oldest institution of higher learning. We are older than the University of Texas. We were founded in 1875, which is 10 years after Juneteenth. And if you really stop and process that, that speaks a lot about the university, um, about historically black colleges in, in general, but Houston Tillerson specifically, that we were truly educating descendants of slaves and slaves themselves, people who had been enslaved. And that really just says something about who we are. So we are about um, 1,100 students. Um, I'm very proud of my students there. We call them the genius generation. We're a campus of, campus of no language of lack. We enter into a sense of abundance to show students that they are geniuses, but you have to sometimes shove, dismantle all that layers of stuff that gets on our young people through their matriculation in K-12, where they're told they're less than, you're not going to have these opportunities, you can't do this, why don't you think about this? So we come into a sense of abundance where you bring your 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 ancestry, your 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 divine knowledge and that's why we all love black panther so much because the movie because it showed us who we really are as a people so i um we um we our our largest growing major is biology uh, i'm an engineer by undergraduate training so i'm really pushing the stem fields here even though we're a liberal arts institution and that liberal arts education makes you the whole person and then we want to have opportunities for our students we have an environmental justice major which speaks to the fact that everything we do on this campus has some aspect of social justice to it some some way of social justice i, I really like that one of our english professors uh, is a spoken word um, infamous person in spoken word, in the spoken word. And she uses black superheroes to teach English. 
So it's recognizing that we have to be super innovative in how we introduce um, the love of learning to our young people. So I could go on and on and on about Houston Tillerson. We are an oasis in the middle of a very prosperous city that's not prosperous for all. So the struggle continues. Austin is a wonderful place, but it has its moles and warts, which I'm sure we'll get to later. So you, the majority of my job is promoting the university for time and treasure. And if you go to the university's website, www.htu.edu, we do have a COVID-19 support fund. And we use that fund to be able to buy Surface tablets for all registered students for the fall because we're fully online now because of um, when Langston, Dr. Clark said when COVID hit and COVID struck, um, we had to go fully online. And one of the barriers that we found our students had was the technology. So we wanted to address that and we provide each student with a, a, a tablet, but the needs continue for access and affordability. So please consider Houston Tillerson University as an investment. We are not a charity. We look for investors. And we also have a book club, President's Book Club, where we're reading a book more than enough. Because like I was saying, we want our students to know that they are more than enough. So if you're interested in dialoguing with young um, people of color about um, on a book, I'm, I'm an avid reader. So about a book, then please go. You can go to our website and find out information about our, the President's Book Club. I would love to, um, to have people of all walks of life to join us. So I'm, I'm grateful to be here. Thank you, President Pierce Burnett. So um, next, I want to uh, have the author of the book, uh, Dr. Eddie Cole, just kind of give us some insights into your inspiration for writing the book, why you wrote the book, and what you hope uh, the audience who hasn't read it and those who did read it get out of reading the book when they do. Yeah, uh, wow. Well, uh, good evening, everyone, uh, depending on what time zone you're, you're in. Maybe it's late afternoon for you, uh, but happy to be here. And uh, Dr. Clark, thank you for the invitation absolutely just thrilled to be in conversation with everyone and dr pierce burnett thank you for joining me for this conversation and everybody watching near and far uh, it means a lot to tune in to talk about the book so uh let me give a little backstory and it ties in directly to what dr pierce burnett just mentioned regarding the value of education so i'm from a family of high school teachers um and that that's really what pushed me toward even thinking about the book and thinking about education and thinking about the Jim Crow South in the way that I think about it. So brief backstory, I'm from West Alabama, Greene County, specifically a town called Bology. And so my parents, again, school teachers there, and actually my father's parents also were school teachers that started their careers being school teachers in the one room schoolhouses. You know, we know those images from the 30s and 40s. That's where my grandparents started their careers. Uh, so, you know, by the time I came along through the public school system in Greene County, Alabama, you know, formal Jim Crow was out of the way, but the remnants of the past were still there. And I always like to talk about this example to where my public all black high school was on across the street around the corner from a segregation academy, predominantly white, right? There wasn't far apart in the county. We could hear each other, the school kids, the schoolyards could hear each other. So even as a teenager, I was mindful that somewhere along the way, there were some educational leaders that made decisions in the past that still impacted our educational experiences in the present. And so having that in mind from a personal perspective, as I went on to formally study education, uh, I, I, I started thinking if the impact of my local school system can be so blatant and so stark, then what about the power of college presidents who lead these colleges and universities that have a reach well beyond their, you know, their campus, well beyond their city that can impact entire states, if not the nation or the world. And so that's what really pushed me to start thinking about the college presidency, particularly as it pertains to the Black Freedom Movement. And so looking at college presidents historically, as I was beginning this research over really a 10 year period, I went through the, the Occupy Wall Street movement, if some of us may remember that, to where there was a lot of student unrest on college campuses particularly around the role of capitalism and its relationship to predominantly white universities specifically. And then we got into 2015 and we saw widespread black student activism coming off campuses like the University of Missouri and elsewhere. But each time as we were looking at these national headlines around race and higher education and looking at academic leaders, uh, the public statements issued oftentimes made those incidents sound like a one-off. 
It was something in the contemporary moment that, you know, the, the statement usually goes something, this isn't, you know, this doesn't align with our values. But when you look at history, oftentimes, particularly on, say, a predominantly white institution, say UT Austin, to pick on them, for instance, you see, actually, that is woven throughout the history of that university, particularly as it comes to black students, staff, and faculty. I always got to include staff and faculty as well, not just the black student experience. So what does it mean to be on those campuses? So given that backstory, uh, that's how I came to write the book, thinking a lot about the black freedom movement in general, but also the role of college presidents. So as I as I explain um, in the introduction to the book to anyone just picking up a copy or already deep into, in, into the book, this is a history of the black freedom movement as seen through the actions of college presidents. And I would add that the fact that the book is written from the perspective of college presidents is one of the things that makes it um, rich and unique because I, I don't think I've ever read a history um, from from that particular lens. And I'm, I'm an education scholar, scholar myself. So I, I thought it was very interesting. Um, one of the chapters that stood out to me was chapter two. Um, and chapter two was titled, We Simply Cannot Operate in Slums, the University and Housing Discrimination. And so one of the things that like black people are talking about like across the country um, is gentrification, right? Uh, neighborhoods that used to be the hood that, that white folk or people with money uh, and I would say even some cases middle class black folk were afraid to move into or live in um, didn't want to live there but then all of a sudden there's these economic and political shifts and we see people wanting to move back in these neighborhoods and so um, I was wondering if Eddie if you could provide some historical context for us about how universities maybe how in chapter two the University of Chicago in particular kind of set up some of these housing discrimination practices. And then President uh, Pierce Burnett, if you could talk about what, how you see Houston Tillerson's role um, in the midst of gentrification over there in East Austin. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Getting right into it, I see. Um, you know, so <laughs> housing discrimination, uh, the, here's, I'm trying to see how, as a historian, how can I be brief, right? Because we like to lecture and talk for a long time. But, uh, Post-World War II, this is, you know, straightforward, Black veterans go abroad and they come back and, you know, they, they fought for dem democracy around the world, but they come back and they're treated like second-class citizens, right? And one of the most blatant forms of that ends up being housing discrimination and racial restrictive covenants, not just in Chicago, but in major cities across the United States. And that becomes a norm. But as racial restrictive covenants are struck down by the Supreme Court in the late 1940s, all of a sudden, Areas that were longtime black neighborhoods, uh, what these white college presidents on these major urban universities would say is the black community is encroaching near campus. And basically, decades of housing discrimination forced black people, particularly those in the South who were moving to the Northeast, the Midwest, and out West, to find whatever space possible in these overcrowded cities where they could live. Now, Chicago example becomes very uh, indicative of the rest of the nation in the sense that the Woodlawn community to the south of the University of Chicago, which is located in Hyde Park, which is, you know, home of Barack Obama, right? And the Washington Park uh, neighborhood, which is to the west of Hyde Park. These are predominantly black neighborhoods, even in the 1940s and 50s, and more and more black residents start to move into Hyde Park. Now, what happens is the University of Chicago, post-World War II, this is interesting, when enrollments are usually skyrocketing because of the GI Bill, University of Chicago enrollment is actually going down because white faculty, white students, and so forth don't want to live at, don't want to attend the University of Chicago or live in that neighborhood anymore, basically because it's too close to black people. Now, because of this, University of Chicago Chancellor Lawrence Kipton, and it's important to name these individuals too, actually rounds up a meeting of college presidents from Harvard, MIT, Columbia, Yale and the University of Pennsylvania, these six men, uh, powerful, well-established universities come together and they devise a plan to where they start lobbying to the federal government to have Federal Housing Act money earmarked for universities that they ultimately can start buying up this property. That's considered slum property and the program now commonly referred to as urban renewal. And so what you see is the urban renewal programs 
that are implemented in major cities across the United States are in no small part largely implemented the way they are because of college presidents. And oftentimes we don't think about the role of academic leaders in history in shaping the Federal Housing Act and how millions of dollars were used by colleges and universities to actually displace thousands of black households across America. So when we think about housing discrimination historically, it certainly lends us to ask different questions about gentrification today. Mm. That's deep. Dr. Pierce Burnett, we know Austin has its issues with gentrification. So if you could provide us your, your, your current lens as a, as a university president at HBCU. One of the first knee scrapes, deep knee scrapes that I got as in my presidency was I used the word gentrification in a positive light in a public forum. And it was because I had not taken the time to research Austin's history when it comes to East Austin. I had only looked at the first story. I hadn't dug deep enough into the second story. So I said something about um, HBCUs that, have, that thrive in areas that have experienced some form of gentrification, like the AU Center there in Atlanta, um, like Howard with there with U Street Corridor, um, Morgan State there in Baltimore. Um, there are very there are several cases or not cases but instances of HBCUs that are in gentrified areas, but the difference is um, black people are the decision makers in many of those areas as opposed to here in Austin. That that that's what goes to why we push for um, black people to be in positions to make decisions about uh, impact to communities. So I show up in a meeting and I'm, you know, advocating, advocating for my institution. And I had um, researched the university while well, my son had researched it um, and found that 78702, which is the zip code that Houston Tillerson University is in, had the second highest amount of gentrification outside of New York City. So what that signals is a lot of development a lot of businesses, a lot of entrepreneur, and a lot of opportunity. I think, you know, my students, you know, just a lot of opportunity. But it did not translate that way because of the history of Austin. Um, in, in 1928, there was a legal by the city called the Negro Plan. And all of the Black people from the different Black communities that had begun to really establish themselves across the Austin region, Austin, Texas region, were forced to live in 78702, or you could not get your zip code. I mean, you not, could not get your utilities turned on. So that is a scar, a deep, ugly, horrendous scar. And so this community where the university sits is predominantly black and was at some point a thriving institution, I mean, a thriving community for black people. But then as we all know, urban areas, um, drugs seep in, um, people get um, desperate, um, high taxes. We all know the history of, of our nation uh, through the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, just how black people were not given opportunities. And then to, to, to compound it, there was another zoning um, plan, if you will, that put very dangerous entities in this community, like incinerators, things that you don't want in your backyard. So, so this, this area was treated very poorly by the city of Austin. And, um, but then we sit up on a hill, Blue Bonnie Hill. People tell me that it's the second highest uh, hill in Austin. We have a beautiful view of the Capitol, a beautiful view of downtown Austin. And our founders got this property because it was cheap. You could not farm it. Now that's very different right now. So the East Austin became very attractive. So I-35, which runs through the middle of Austin, became a divider of the black side of town and the white side of town. University of Texas, our sister institution, is on the west side of town. And Houston Tillerson is on the east side of town. Almost a tale of two cities over time. So my university really just kind of huddled into itself up on this hill. And over time, it became just kind of separated from the community. Just by nature of trying to survive, trying to stay solvent, or trying to continue to do what we do. So um, this is attractive land now. So that development hopped over 35 and all of a sudden, everybody wants to be in East Austin. 
So it's really a community of dichotomies. I could drive, to, I was live, living, I live, work and play in East Austin when I got here first, my first four years of my administration. And I would drive to work and see the white female jogging along with her baby and the dog behind her and the brother sitting under what my husband calls the tree, knowledge of, the tree of knowledge, you know, on the kitchen chairs, um, you know, solving all the world's problems. And it's just, a, it was a very interesting community. So my role I, has become to continue to advocate for the equity because pe black people still live here. 400 of them in normal times live up here on this hill with me. So when people, there's people say there are no more black people in, in, in East Austin, that's not really true. The fight continues. And we're an oasis and a sacred space and we are a reminder of a thriving community and what it means for equity in a community. And I serve as um, the mayor of Austin's, a co-chair co co of the mayor of Austin's task force on institutional racism and systemic inequity. And housing is a major part of that conversation about what we can do for, for equity in housing for all people. Um, but clearly I'm, you know, I'm, I'm Issa Rae, I root for everybody black. So unapologetically, I have this lens of where I, you know, really focusing on improving the stand, the quality of life for Black people, as it, as for so that this prosperous city can be prosperous for all, and housing is one of those determinants in that conversation. So I, I have to ask this question. Um, so in the midst of like all the George Floyd stuff, the Breonna Taylor things like that, have um, you know, Austin's like a tech city. It's the Silicon Hills, right? Have have people come, have companies come to you to talk about ways that they can invest in the institution? And I guess what I'm asking is how 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 can HT and maybe some other HBCUs and communities that are being gentrified do what they can to at least take advantage of some of the benefits that that would be there? And that then that's you know, that's that's you know, I, I live off this African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. We have worked really hard, even pre-pandemic, current pandemic and post-pandemic to build relationships. And we've had some successes, some really, some big successes. Now, uh, this is, comes out in the book about the line that presidents have to walk. I'm not crazy. You know, I, I've got to live in Austin, but I have some pain points where there have been some entities in Austin that talk a good game, but then when it comes down to actually investing in the university, suddenly all the rules change. And I've had some really bad, some, some painful experiences for me that I, you're an advocate for the Black Lives Matter in public, but then Black Lives Don't Matter in private. Yeah. And so, um, but I can't call that out and continue to raise money from my university. So I have to be very delicate in that in my presidency because I want to continue to build collaborations. So that's a very fine line that you walk on a daily, on a daily basis. I mean, an hourly basis where you're advocating. That's why I, I, I'm proud to say that we are unapologetically a historically black college and stand firm for what I say. But I also know that in many cases, not all philanthropy white people, white philanthropists are more apt to give to white organizations serving black people as opposed to giving to black led organizations. That is a barrier. So we have to continue to work our way around it. Now we have some, um, we have some, there are some good stories that like we have a, a, a very wonderful relationship with Apple. Apple underwrites the cost of our, we have an African American male teachers initiative. Um, recruiting and retaining and graduating black males to be teachers such as yourselves. So Af Apple underwrites that um, just freely and it, um, it, they, it's, they, they do well by the university. Yeah. Um, Merck, so there are some really positive stories about entities in the Apple and the, and the Austin area that have leaned in, but it's not across the board. We still have a very long way to go. Um, we have foundations here that will give to build athletic facilities. Um, but when you go to say, can you invest in the education of some black and brown, it's always something else. Yeah. So, so that's, that is, continues to be a challenge. And I think it's important to note that like HT is probably like this far from being a Hispanic serving institution too. Because y'all have a diversity of students. It, it is still thoroughly an HBCU, 
but but when we talk about diversity in higher education, I think Houston Tillerson is more representative of that than what you might see at some PWIs. We definitely are. We are. We hover around 25%, which you cannot have both designations as an HBCU and Hispanic serving institutions uh, within the federal government. I don't know why, but that's that's the rule. Yeah. Um, so um, we're we're very diverse um, in that respect, and we're diverse on many aspects, which is a part of the beauty of the historically black college experience. People say there's no diversity there. That's not real. It's diverse in religious, it's, it's diverse in um, socioeconomic status, it's diverse in where people come across the country. So it's diverse in thought. And that's the beauty of the experience that you can come here, and you don't have to be the black kid in the class. Yeah. You just be yourself. That's and right. um, that's, that's a part of the beauty of the experience. And we've never discriminated. That's important to say that our universities have never discrim discriminated from their founding. Yeah, that's true. What, it, what I'm thinking about um, when, you, when you, I think reading the book and hearing you speak, presidents don't have the same freedom of speech that maybe students have, that maybe faculty have, that maybe even like some guest speakers have. And so chapter six, I believe it is, talks about freedom of speech um, on college campuses and whatnot, and w what happens at, at Princeton right at about the time where integration is, is happening. And so, Eddie, I was wondering, again, if you could kind of provide some historical context for freedom of speech on college campuses as it relates to the Black freedom struggle. And then um, President Pierce Burnett, if, if you maybe could do the same on how that, because that's, that's a huge topic in higher ed right now anyway, with how polarized things are. So, how does, how does freedom of speech maybe exist at a, at a small HBCU? Because we hear it a lot at the white schools, but not so much from the minority serving institutions. Yeah, that's a great question. And yeah, I mean, on the eve of the election, uh, you want to talk about free speech and the context we're in and how politicized anything, right? Even saying critical race theory and studying, you know, in white supremacy in education is being uh, critiqued from the White House on down. Uh, so historically, you know, that's a great question. Oftentimes when we think of free speech, that's one of those um, policies on college campuses that isn't always tied to racial questions, uh, particularly the Black Freedom Movement. I mean, there are a lot of historians, a lot of scholars who talk about free speech, but it, they don't often uh, frame it within the context of uh, the overall racial equity questions. So uh, in the past, uh, it, it, what I discussed in the book is an instance, instance at Princeton University before the free speech movement at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, so Berkeley, free speech, 1964, that's usually the common start and end point with conversations around speech. But I actually pick up um, in the 1950s at Princeton and look at the roster of people who came to that campus to speak. And what's happening at Princeton, it's an Ivy in New Jersey, but it's very much Southern in culture and tradition in the 1940s and 50s, in the sense that really until the mid 1940s, post World War II, it's an all white campus for the most part, all male, all white. But by the time you get to the mid, late 1950s, early 1960s, they're actively working to recruit black students for the first time. Now, there's some self interest in that move by Princeton because their chief rivals in the Ivy League, Yale and Harvard, are really outpacing them and having black students on campus. So Princeton is finally trying to keep up with the times. So not to give Princeton too much credit for finally admitting black students seriously in the 1960s. But what happens is at the same time those initiatives are being launched, Ross Barnett, the white supremacist segregationist governor from Mississippi is invited to speak on Princeton's campus. And you know, I mean, just if you know nothing about the civil rights era, <laughs> uh, Ross Barnett, is just horrible, right? He's up there with George Wallace. I mean, you can name the segregationist governors across the South who had not a single good thing to say about black pe people, black freedom. Uh, we were less than second class citizens to these individuals, right? Mm -hmm. Now, how do you actively recruit black students and welcome Ross Barnett to your campus? Something, <laughs> something's gotta give in that case. So. Ultimately, what I discuss is uh, what tends to offer some insights for contemporary issues is that, yes, there's a white supremacist 
governor coming to speak on campus, but President Robert Goheen at Princeton actually allows, right, doesn't push back. Barnett does speak at Princeton, but instead of just issuing a public statement which condemns Governor Barnett, which the president does, even in the 1960s, he condemns President Barnett. But after, I mean, after Governor Barnett speaks, he also launches actual initiatives to show how the university condemned Governor Barnett. And I think that's critical, right? Because too often we get a public statement, you know, that this doesn't align with our values, our morals and so forth, but what are you gonna do about it? And that's what we see oftentimes, especially in 2020, all these college campuses, like you just said, President Pierce Burnett, it's easy to, to say Black Lives Matter, but what are you actually doing to show that Black Lives Matter? And particular things were launched at Princeton that fundamentally changed that campus um, in ways that hadn't happened in his first 250 years of its existence. And so actively recruiting uh, black students, changing housing policies. If you were a local landlord and you discriminated against, you were removed from Princeton University, uh, renters list, uh, contractors that had, you know, building for Princeton University, they had to have active, uh, you know, non-discrimination clauses and who they hired and those sort of things. Actual initiatives were launched that were a step toward actual racial equity overall in context of the Black Freedom Movement. And that's important because that all happens a matter of two weeks after the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing in Birmingham, Alabama, where four Black girls are killed. So the context matters to what's going on in society and how when you're having a national ra racial moment, college presidents historically have been able to leverage that to implement change that they couldn't beforehand. Um, the only thing I can amplify out of that, which is so well said, is that I wouldn't, I, I want to go back a, a moment. I wouldn't say that black college, that college presidents don't have freedom of speech. I, I think you have to go the extra step on your delivery. Mm. So how you deliver it so that you don't lose your audience or your point. And that takes some work. You have to, like, I have to consciously think about my delivery on what I'm saying um, to articulate where I stand as, uh, as the president of the university at the direction of my board. Um, one thing I would say about freedom of speech is we don't want to tell students what to think. We want to tell them what to think about. Mm. So you often want, uh, most times I would say, different opinions or different stands. And if as long as it doesn't, um, it's, as long as it's civil, you're, you're getting that message across and you're being civil on, 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 on our campus, then you're, you're, um, we have to be open to your opinion. Because if we don't do that, then we're actually doing to, uh, to our students what has been done to us for so long, which is stifling thought and creativity um, through design, by design. And so I, I think it's very important that you, as long as it's civil and as long as it's not blatant uh, uh, criminal or just blatant disregard of human dignity and respect, which is important irrespective of what your ultimate message is. I think that's very important that we don't tell students what to think, but we want to tell them what to think about. Mm -hmm. so we want to have a diversity of speakers. And I have been, um, we had one instance where we had a speaker uh, for one of our charter day, uh, which is a big deal for us, uh, one of our convocations, which is a big deal for us, who was a bit controversial. And so like what Dr. Cole said, then we have to go back and reiterate what we stand for, our own core values, and it's action. You can have a great message and with no action behind it. So you want to have something that, that, that is actionable with where you stand as an institution in line with your, whatever, what the core values are of your institution. So I, I'm imagining that if, if COVID wasn't going on right now, that Candace Owens, she, she might be doing a Black College tour right now. And I hope she, she might take this idea and go with it. But I'm just saying, I, I, I want to know what that conversation looks like with the dissenting Black voice, right? And how, how, how do we have conversations like that on, on HBCU campuses? Um, I think that would be something that would be interesting, but I think again, like as a president, you would have to walk that fine line with the with with the the, 
the the majority I think of the black community who was like, she brought her to campus. You know, you know this, it's not free speech just for you know in a political realm, but we've had artists that my students love, and we you know we we are a faith based institution, and their delivery of their message, even though it's genius, you know I use that analogy all the time. Uh, you you try to rap. The iterations you get your brain to communicate with your 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 mouth that quickly yeah. um rhyming and doing a message you know on the fly uh, so that's that's genius but there have been some artists that our students want to come for homecoming that um and that is freedom of speech but then i as the president you know have to you know talk to my student affairs people and say that i have a you know there's a line there so it's, it's, it can be complicated. And we've yeah. had situations where we have artists come and they sign a contract and, you know, no cursing, no this, no degradation of women, you know, no degradation of the university, et cetera. And then they get on the stage and <laughs> it evolves differently. So it's, 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 so freedom of speech stretches, you know, the gamut. It's not just about the political aspects of it. And then we've had some artists who are um, known to, you know, use language that's not appropriate for church and have come and are just brilliant in their delivery to students um, because they, they have another side of them. Very brilliant, yeah. wonderful young people that young people listen to. So we don't want to tell them what to think about. We want to tell them what, what to think. We want to tell them what to think about and have opposing ideas. Hmm. Just like you know, shouldn't watch CNN all the time. Sometimes you stretch yourself and see what the other side is saying and watch you know, a little bit of Fox, a little bit of MSNBC, stretch yourself so that you see what, what, what what's happening out there. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, let me just chime in. I think that's, that's absolutely brilliant and you're right. And we see that historically as well. A lot of voices, a lot of, within the black community came to, college, came to black college campuses uh, during the black freedom movement. Absolutely. So there's, there's one chapter in the book that focuses primarily on the president of an HBCU, and that, that's the first chapter. Um, and I believe his name is Martin Jenkins of uh, Morgan State University. And Eddie, I'm, could you, uh, again, um, kind of provide the context for the line that he has to walk in terms of um, operating in the mainstream space but then also operating in this historically black space and the challenges with maintaining the institution in the midst of integration, which is what I think is now the diversity and inclusion narrative. And so maybe uh, President Pierce Burnett, if you could talk about how maybe HT kind of walks that line for diversity and inclusion, but still maintaining its identity in the midst of, you know, a, a larger mainstream institution that is UT Austin there in, there in Austin, Texas. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And, you know, Dr. Pierce Burnett has laid out nicely um, some of the ongoing uh, challenges of being an HBCU president. Because Martin Jenkins is the president at Morgan State uh, starting in 1948. And it's important to understand some of his backstory because he's born in Terre Haute, Indiana, 1904, but leaves Indiana, goes to Howard University in the early 1920s for undergrad. And that's the, you know, Harlem Renaissance New Negro Movement is happening in the 1920s. So someone from small town Indiana, a black, black man, black young teenager from small town Indiana goes to Washington, D.C. of all places. And he's exposed to, I mean, brilliant black thinkers and so forth at Howard University. And then afterwards goes back home after graduating from Howard, uh, briefly, <laughs> briefly living um, in, you know, Terre Haute, Indiana and immediately getting out of there and going on to Northwestern University for both his master's and his doctorate. Okay, that's important to understand because he follows this very common trajectory around academics in the early 1900s, black academics specifically in the early 1900s, who, who largely went to black colleges for their undergraduate degree, but because of underfunding, historical underfunding and so forth, how black colleges started graduate programs, advanced degrees weren't common at HBCUs at that point. So they go on to these large uh, white universities in the Midwest, Northeast, and so forth. Now, here's what Martin Jenkins does that actually really guides him when he becomes president at Morgan State. He really, walk, he really walks and lives in two academic worlds. 
uh, between earning his PhD in 1935 and becoming Morgan State President in 1948. This 13-year journey as a faculty member at a number of HBCUs, mostly back at Howard, but he, he publishes in white-run academic journals because he co-authors studies with his um, PhD dissertation chair for Northwestern, and he finds himself uh, conducting these wide national studies on Black youth and gifted education, of all things. Um, and then, at the same time, he's publishing these assessments of Black colleges and enrollment numbers in the Journal of Negro Education as well as Crisis Magazine run by the NAACP, right? So he's really building out this personal network that he eventually launches when he becomes president of Morgan State in 1948, because what's happening at Morgan State, the University of Maryland is under repeated uh, NAACP lawsuit, forcing it to desegregate. And the University of Maryland is very stubborn. You think the University of Alabama, University of Georgia have a bad reputation? You should really look into Maryland as a unique Upper South state um, that's been was dogged in maintaining segregation. All that said, the University of Maryland president is segregationist. President Byrd, who in more recent news has his he's the football stadium's named after him, so that's been pushed back on that campus present day over having that renamed. Uh, Byrd actually wants to remove Morgan State's independent board of trustees and have Morgan State fall under the University of Maryland board. And so it's this fight for black independence, control of black institutions, which is what President Pierce Burnett just mentioned, right? It's one thing to, you know, have a black institution. It's another thing to have it run by black people. Uh, and Martin Jenkins does his just delicate dance, his entire presidency to uh, maintain Morgan State's independence to where Morgan State can lobby to the State House in Annapolis on its own behalf and not have the University of Maryland lobby uh, on its behalf as well. And so that just gives a snippet and just to the pure complexities of being a Black college president in the Jim Crow South and how oftentimes there were these hidden networks among themselves to where if Martin Jenkins couldn't say it on his campus, he would have a guest come and say it on his behalf. I mean, it's just pure strategy in a moment where lynchings are happening. I mean, it's really a matter of life and death in a fight for black liberation through education. Mm. And the challenges in Maryland continue. You know, the, those schools won the, the, the federal government sued on the, sued the state on their behalf and they went to court a long litigation and they won and then the, it's being appealed. Um, and they're in good hands. Um, my brother, President David Wilson, there now is just really a sharp individual. He's just wonderful leader at that at that time there at Morgan, Morgan Coppin, and University of Maryland Eastern Shore. So that struggle continues, and people don't realize that that that's a real and that's coming from years of segregation and underfunding um, that that the state did. I was at Central State University in Ohio before coming to Houston Tillerson, and I. Um, studied Wilberforce extensively, who is the first African-American owned and operated HBCU, not the first HBCU, but the first African-American owned and operated. And Lionel Newsom, Central State was an off, was, came from Wilberforce. So Lionel Newsom was a, one of the longstanding phenomenal leaders at Central State. And he told a story where he would go to the state legislature and he would wear shoes with holes in the bottom and cross his feet so that they could see him as needy, even though he was not, because he was a phenomenal scholar and a brilliant man, but they had to humble themselves mm. because they wanted the state of Ohio to continue to invest in Central. And Central State also was, um, the federal government sued the state of Ohio on behalf of Central State because of years of underfunding and actually opening up a predominantly white institution within a bird's eye throw Right, right, State University, um, right, and which hurt Central's enrollment. So, which was a, something that was illegal in the state. They would never open up another university to my own alma, close to my own alma mater, Ohio State. That just wouldn't happen. So, um, and Central is now continuing to be a, a, a thriving institution, and Wilberforce stands on its own. So, this whole concept of having to humble yourself in order for the states to be able to to invest in you is not new 
-hmm. And um, it's easier now. We have better language now. And when we talk about diversity and inclusion, I see those words as peanut butter and jelly words. They make they make people feel mm. good. Say that again. Say that again. <laughs> if you like, it's like if you no one wants to be the chief civil rights and social justice officer. Um, it just feels better to say diversity and inclusion, but it's really about our civil rights and social justice. Those are just feel good words. Um, and when we it's 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 unfortunate that we have to continue to fight this battle. But um, it's a necessary battle yeah. because we need more more individuals like yourselves in these spaces to be able to do the research and tell the story and continue to bring people's attention to the fact that the struggle continues. It is not over. We as a nation were lulled to sleep in the, um, the 60s. We thought we got, we got equality, but we didn't get equity. Yeah. And then we have now been shaken awake, um, which th these challenges that we have as a nation are not new. They're, what they are is they're highlighted. Yeah. And then COVID-19 has forced us to sit still in it with the horrendous death of George Floyd. It's, it's, it's forced us to sit still in it. So it's now it's like, what do we do? Yeah. So I have to give time for the audience to ask a few questions, but I got to ask this one last question. So the last chapter talks about how presidents at elite predominantly white institutions basically they undermined what was supposed to be affirmative action. The narrative we hear about affirmative action now is like black people admitted into white jobs, white, white institutions for work, white institutions for school. But that last chapter lays out how affirmative action was going to be the uplift of historically black colleges and maybe a more accurate and true um, representation of what integration is versus assimilation. So. It, it was about institutional uplift that I think would have been better for black colleges. And the question I have for you all is, um, is there redemption for predominantly white institutions? Are, are they redeemable? And I, I don't think they are. And when I say that, I don't mean to say that we shouldn't go there, that we shouldn't take, take advantage of the relationships we can build with people there. And I don't mean that to be using people like the authentic, like friendships that we can have across cultures and races and things like that. Um, but institutionally, I don't think that we can rely on diversity and inclusion initiatives at PWIs to right the wrongs of the past. So I, I would like to get you all's thoughts on that. And then we'll take some questions from the audience. Dr. Pierce Burnett. So, so I think it's, it has to be a combination of things. There's just no one path or no one solution finder. It has to be a combination of things. Higher education is playing a role. And HBCUs are not for everyone. We are not monolithic. We are not all the same. And we're not all for everyone. Like in my own life, my son went to a Hampton and my daughter went to a, a, a PWI, a fashion in, in New York City, that was that was where she that was her her direction. And my son needed to go to an HBCU. You know, he, he needed that that nurturing. There are three things that we do best. We cultivate nurturing systems and spaces. Um, we leverage our cult, African American culture, and we like what I said earlier. We have very high expectations of our students. Those are three things that HBCUs do extremely well. Affirmative action somehow got rolled into not qualified. And affirmative action was originally designed to give people an opportunity to be at the table and to be considered for something. I'm a, I, I, affirmative action got me an interview one time because mm. they had to interview so many black people. And I ended up getting the job because I was qualified. But if not for affirmative action, I would not have gotten the interview. So it has its, 
its bright spots and has its pain points. And the role of higher education, I can speak from for historically black colleges, and I did not attend a historically black college, but I've committed my professional life to the to the mission because it is a, a it's a necessary mission in our society. We built the middle class. We get a lot of bad heat because of metrics with, but that higher education looks at, like graduation rates, persistent rates, et cetera. But if you compare our graduation rates apple to apple with the population that we serve to predominantly white institutions, we fare better. I mean, everybody knows the data about the most HBCUs, the most engineers, the most lawyers, the most um, doctorates, students, et cetera, come from an undergrad of historically black colleges. So we have a lot of work to do, but we need resources and investment because it takes, it take, particularly if you're serving poor people, it's expensive to serve poor people. Yeah. First generation students need resources. They need, they need systems. They, need, um, they don't need to be saved. They need good books and good teachers and equitable opportunities. There's a difference there. Yeah. So, and that's what affirmative action was designed to do originally, but then over time it got twisted to be associated with less than. Yeah, you know, I, I, I would add or just simply echo that, yes, affirmative action historically was about you know, system-wide change when it came to higher education. And what we know it to be today is the opposite of that. And so to anyone, again, those of you who are currently reading the book or, you know, about to pick it up and get into it, I think it is a unique uh, history to understand how college presidents were coming together, both the leaders of black colleges, as well as those leading the wealthier, predominantly white institutions, were making these programs out together. And most of these programs focused on black campuses. And it was fine because the distribution of resources was not going to alter the caliber or the resources or you know, technology on white campuses. And it was only going to finally give what black colleges had been underfunded for so many years. But, but you know, when publicity gets involved, when media, when you know, prestige and all these things got in the way, a lot of presidents of these predominantly white universities actually slowly dismantled this idea for system-wide change and really made it very individualistic. And so we can have a broader conversation around the arms race and what does it mean when uh, two colleges are in the same city and they're, you know, you know, fighting for resources. Uh, you know, that's, that's a historic issue. That's a contemporary issue. And uh, ultimately with the book, I try to um, weave us through the history of that to give us a different way to think about today. Yeah. You did that very well. Yeah. Like Thank you. Stuff. Thank yeah. you so much. So I'm going to allow a few of y'all to ask some questions. I'm going to ask that y'all ask quick, concise, clear questions so we can get as many questions in before um, we, we have our speakers go because we, be we want to be respectful of their time. So I'm going to start with Dr. Sharice Nelson. I'm going to allow you to talk and so you can just ask your question when you're ready. Dr. Nelson. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. This is this has been great. So to be very concise, I'm a professor at Southern University and I have a, a piece coming out in the Negro Journal of Education about why HBCU should be funded as a pillar of reparation. Uh, and so my question goes to both of you succinctly is, is that um, what do you believe that the funds that would come down from such a bill like like HR 40, which does the exploration, do you feel like that would then help to deal with a lot of the inequities that we see in the funding uh, uh, stream and the structure? And would you benefit then from, or would, there be, or would there be some level of benefit from a liaison at the state level who was required to work with the state institutions and the private institutions uh, in the same way as the book talks about in this lobbying that happens uh, to the federal and the local government? Dr. Pierce Burnett, I'll turn it over to you because that's a contemporary funding question. Well, I'm, I'm a private school, so we don't have the ben benefit of state funding. I will never complain about state funding ever again, having come from a state school, because at least you get some funding from the state. But to answer your question succinctly, the answer is yes, because funding is funding. Funding streams are funding streams. As long as there is a management of it, that it's truly, um, I don't, 
atonement, reparations, people use all kinds of words in that conversation. The key thing is that we make amends and repair the harm done. So if the funding is specific to that, then I think the answer to your question is yes. And, can, and good for you to be doing that study. And to, I will look forward to the release of, you said, when did you say you're gonna release your? It's in, re, it's in review, you know how us academics do. So we're, it, it's in review in the Journal of Education right now. And they're, okay. and they're hammering me they're hammering, hammering me about affirmative action. So it's kind of funny because they're hammering me in the in, in my argument inside of the article about affirmative action one, and then also then about integration, right? And the and the and the complicated question of integration and how it affects HBCUs. Uh, and so I'm I'm working through those comments now. So hopefully we should see it out in the spring. There's enough room for everybody in this when we talk about how that hurts HBCUs. Of course it does. But in Texas, there's a 60 by 30. Um, Texas wants 60% of its population to be educated by the year 2030. The only way Texas is going to get to that is by educating more black and brown and people of low socioeconomics. And that's what HBCUs do. We do it and well. And, so, and Doc, I just want to say thank you so much for your leadership in that. And we're, we're you know, the, the streets, as we would say, the streets are watching. We saw how you shut down the campus and gave all your students laptops and hotspots so that they could participate in, in that education. So we're watching. Thank you. All right. So Patrick Smith, you had a question in the Q&A, but I'm going to allow you to ask it live. So if you're ready, go ahead and ask your question, Patrick. You got three seconds. There you go. Okay. okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so, so my question simply is, uh, given what you stated, uh, Dr. Pierce, uh, Dr. Burnett, Burnett Pierce, excuse me, uh, uh, concerning walking that line of advocacy, uh, where do you draw the line between uh, when it comes to being truly yourself or, or truly who you are as a black leader of a black, a predominantly black institution? And then, you know, uh, you know, being that advocate and being up front, out front, and and and, and holding the, the mantle piece of, of the call. So if you can address that question, please. So quickly before Langston cuts me off, because I want to be invited back to the entrepreneurial appetite. Um, I have to follow my own moral compass. So I want to I want to go home at night and be able to look at myself in the mirror and say that I spoke my truth. And if it offends people, then those people weren't on my team to advance the university anyway. So if I, if I feel like I'm tucking my tail, I'm being asked to tuck my tail, I'm not gonna do that. I have to speak my truth and I have to follow my own moral compass as the leader of the institution and in keeping with the vision that the board has set for us as an institution. The minute you, and your instincts tell you when you're not being true to your authentic self and when you're not following your moral compass. And I, I, and I wouldn't be serving my students if I wasn't showing up as myself. That's a really good question. Yeah, and I would just add, I would just add to uh, Patrick's question. Historically, we see that as well, right? And especially when I study the personal correspondence of Black college presidents, there's very distinctive uh, who they are publicly and who they are privately. Uh, those things are in line because they got a moral code um, that's guiding their leadership. Mm -hmm. All right. So, last question. I always ask this of the author. Um, this is this is an academic book. It's not a difficult read at all. Um, but I, I'm wondering how do black parents and black communities, black schools, teachers, educators, how do we have this conversation about the role of college presidents with children? Maybe, maybe someone's a high school student. So how do, how do we begin to have these conversations with our, our young people? Yeah, that, that's a great question. What I, what I focus on in the book are a number of prominent issues. And these are things that, you know, teenagers considering colleges can think about. And one of those is community, as we already discussed around housing discrimination, free speech is an issue. We talk about access. We talk about university organizational structures. These are prominent issues that impact the black freedom movement. So if you step back and want to really make it simple to the general public, right? Not us academics, but to the general public, these are issues that anybody can relate to that are covered in the book, right? You've got to pay property tax, you're paying rent, whatever. Are you paying more rent than say somebody on the other side of town or what? All these sort of things come into what it means to be a black American historically. And ultimately what the book demonstrates is that as we think about the broader black freedom movement, and all of the numerous struggles for equal rights, 
What is the role that colleges and universities play within those ongoing struggles for black freedom? And so that's what I would tell anyone thinking about the book, even a teenager trying to make sense of this current Black Lives Matter moment. This is a history book that they can pick up, digest, and then start to ask questions of what institutions they, be, they may be interested in. Thank you. I want to thank you both for coming. Um, once again, got to give a shout out to uh, President uh, Pierce Burnett, Dr. Eddie Cole. If you all are interested in giving back to Houston Tillerson University, you can go to www.htu.edu. On their website, they have um, a page for specifically to make donations to help um, uh, mitigate some of the issues with COVID-19 and support their students and whatnot. So um, thank you, all of you for coming. Don't leave yet. Just briefly, I wanna talk about next month because it's uh, Thanksgiving and the holidays. We're going to be meeting on Thursday, November 19th at the same time. A good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Rochelle Delia, is going to talk about a book that her and her husband wrote called Life, Liberty, and Property. Many of you know, if you're on Instagram or whatever, there's all of these Black, you know, personalities and influencers about, like, Black folk get into real estate. And so she's going to have a conversation with us about establishing um, uh, wealth for our families, but doing it in a way that's ethical and supportive of our communities um, so that we aren't pushing uh, other Black folk out of their neighborhoods or, or other people who, who live in neighborhoods or have been in neighborhoods historically. So um, I hope that all of you are able to attend that. And we might have a special pop-up book discussion uh, with another author, but um, that date is yet to be established, but I'm sure it will happen in November as well. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for supporting. Uh, if you want to follow uh, me, you can follow me at Langston D. Clark on both Twitter and Instagram. There is a Entrepreneurial Appetite uh, Instagram page as well as Entrepreneurial underscore Appetite on IG. And so that's where we post. If anyone in the audience has a business or, or if you wrote a book and you're interested in being one of the discussants, one of the participants, we make that opportunity available as well. If you have a book and you just wanna meet and talk to the author, we will see if we can get the author to have a conversation with you and you can take my role and then you can have the, the, the conversation with your favorite author. Because as they know, I get real nervous before all of these. So if someone else wants to take this job, um, I'm happy to have a substitute. So again, thank you, Dr. Pierce Burnett. Thank you, Dr. Cole. Uh, thank you to everyone in the audience. I appreciate y'all's participation today and see you next month. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you. thank you, Dr. Clark, and special thank you, Dr. Pierce Burnett, for joining yes. us. Thank, thank you. you. It's, been a, it's been a blessing. It's a gift. Thank you. Thank you. Can't wait to have you in person when this is all over. That's right. That's right. In Austin. That's right. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you so much. Yes. Mm -hmm.